pipes or we're painting a three-point line out there on the parking lot and Tim said what's the weather supposed to be like tomorrow I said it's gonna be nice and he said uh, I said yeah I prayed about it you know I had <laughs> time to check the weather but I've noticed that so many I can't think of the last time we were rained out or we had bad weather for going out so many God just blesses us with wonderful weather for it I'm not saying that that's some kind of a guarantee or something like that but we have had literally clouds building here and here and here and here and we've just been in like this cocoon of gorgeous weather while we go out and visit. So if you want to be on some nice weather, uh, show up for Soul Winning on Tuesday evening, uh, next Tuesday night. And that's really the main thing that I wanted to emphasize by way of announcement tonight. And so we're going to go ahead and take up our offering at this time. Is Charlie here? He's not. All right. Taj, you're it. You're the man. No, Nathan. Nathan, why don't you come up and help uh, take up the offering tonight? Taj is leading singing, so we're going to put him in a circle. Nathan, nice haircut. Thank you. <laughs> Let's see. Let's pray and bless the Lord bless tonight's offering, shall we? Father, you've been so gracious and so good to us, and for that we're very thankful. And we recognize that this evening that we wouldn't give in the offering to impress you, and that even if we tried, we couldn't, because you, you, you own all things. We also recognize that everything we have is because, Lord, you've entrusted us as stewards with it. And so this evening, I pray that you would help us to be wise stewards, that you would show us precisely what it is that you have us to give. Show us that we'll have your grace and help us to believe that, to be able to give what you've laid on our hearts. And then, God, I just ask your blessing on the giver tonight. And we just thank you so much for this opportunity now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We couldn't have picked a better song than that from this evening's message. Isaiah chapter 25 tonight. Isaiah chapter 25, please. Brother Taj picked the song. <laughs> and he can read. He's a millennial, so you got to give credit. I mean, you yeah. got to like really, you know, give him some accolades for opening a handbook and picking the number. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 25. Our text is going to be verses 6 through 8, so it'll be a short text this evening. And I would actually, though, like to read all the way from verse 1 to verse 8 and read the praise uh, of the prophet Isaiah to the Lord his God. And so we'll read our text, and then we'll pray, and then we'll make some preliminary marks and just get into a very, very simple message this evening that I think will encourage your heart and be a help to you. Uh, verse 1. O Lord, Thou art my God, I will exalt thee, I will praise thy name, for thou hast done wonderful things. Thy counsels of old are faithfulness and truth. For thou hast made of a city in heap, of a defensed city a ruin, a palace of strangers to be no city, it shall never be built. Therefore shall the strong people glorify thee, the city of the terrible nations shall fear thee, for thou hast been a strength to the poor a strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shadow from the heat, when the blast of the terrible ones is a storm against the wall. Thou shalt bring down the noise of strangers as they heat in a dry place, even the heat with the shadow of a cloud. The branch of the terrible ones shall be brought low. And then pay attention, this begins our text, verse 6. And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wine on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of wine on the lee, wines on the lees well refined. And he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people, and the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up in death, up death in victory. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces, and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth. For the Lord has spoken it. Let's pray. Father, I pray that even as we read this series of scriptures that give praise to your name because of the mighty and good God that you are, that tonight you would help us as we focus on the one who is able to swallow up death in victory and wipe away tears from eyes. That God, it would give us a glimpse into who you are. That we would desire not only to know you if we do but already, but to know you better. And for those that do not, Lord, to, to know you first of all. And God, I pray that as we look at the 
the scripture and we look at the fulfillment of these prophecies, that Lord, we would love you more and desire to live for you more as a result. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The last couple of weeks we answered some questions that I think are on the minds of every person who thinks. I, uh, I encourage people to think. And by the way, I don't know everybody in this room this evening. It may be that you uh, have trusted Jesus as your Savior. When we use terms like being born again or saved, then they're terms that, that are very, very near and dear to your heart because you've, you know exactly what they mean. It could be as well that they are things that you're skeptic uh, about. And I encourage for people to ask questions. If you uh, are skeptical of whether or not Jesus is God, ask the questions, but also be honest and get yourself the answer to the questions. And uh, it, I, it, it bothers me sometimes that some Christians don't like to be questioned about anything. Uh, listen, if you know something, then you know it. If you don't know it, you don't. And uh, if you know it, it's in God's Word. If it isn't God's Word, then it isn't true. And so uh, I would encourage people to ask a lot of questions. One of the questions I think is in everyone's heart about God is, if God is good, why does God allow, e allow evil? Right? Isn't that a fair question? It's not a bad question, by the way. I've heard people say, well, you should never question. You should never question God. Well, let's find a question, God. It's wrong to accuse God. And there's a difference, isn't there? It's one thing to say, God, I don't understand. Or to say, God, you're terrible. It, it, because. And so sometimes in a question, is, a question is not a question at all. It's an accusation. Uh, but when a question is actually a question, it's a good thing. And a good question that everyone ought to have is, if God is good, then why is there evil? And one of the things that will satisfy the answer to the question, first of all, is that you'll know uh, that God isn't evil. God is good. And that God is against evil. One of the things that really has helped me in my life is to recognize that God hates evil. And uh, even people who claim to represent God who do evil, God hates that. And so sometimes people are confused about God because of religion, for instance. And let me just be the first this evening to say that in the name of God, in the name of religion, much evil is done. In the name of God, in the name of religion, much evil is done. And you know, we, shouldn't, we should just call it what it is, evil. God hates it, so do I. And uh, you know, I remember a couple of years ago, a brother Al and I were witnessing to a friend of his, and uh, this friend had been abused as a child. He'd been abused as a child in an institution that I think we're pretty well aware of. And uh, so we came, went to his house, and we were inviting him to our church. He lives nearby here, or he did at the time he lived nearby here. And... Uh, he said, I don't, he said, I'm not, he said, I, I believe in God, I'm not the, the church thing, uh uh. You know, I'm not going to do the church thing. And, you know, I said, man, I understand. Brother Al's like, well, you know, you can't throw out the baby with the bathwater. I'm just telling you something. That man's experience at church and what had happened to him, God didn't do. God didn't do that. God hates it. And I told him, I said, God hates it. God's going to judge it. And, you know, that's the way we ought to respond. Sometimes we, we think we have to defend what's done in the name of God. No, my friend. God is not evil. God does not do evil. And God will judge evil. And if you are the one who represents evil in the name of God, my friend, God will judge you. And so it's one part of the answer to the question. But a couple of weeks ago we saw uh, God addressing the rod, or the Syria, Syria, Assyria as the rod of his anger. And the, the scenario was that Assyria would be the nation that God used to come into Judah and to bring them into captivity because of the idolatry at Jerusalem. God had promised great blessing for His people, national Israel. But the blessings, the covenant promises God had a blessing, also had promises that if you aren't faithful to me, these are the things that will happen to you. And so Israel had set up idols. There were idols in Jerusalem. And the king of Assyria, he had a stout heart. And he said in his heart, this is what he said, he said, I'm going to go into Jerusalem and I'm going to destroy the idols there just like I destroyed the idols. And he listed all the other places he'd been at. Hamath and so forth, other cities where he had destroyed. And he said, my, my princes are as kings. And he saw himself as very, very powerful, very, very mighty. And he saw himself as one that God himself could not do anything against. And God simply explained it this way. He said, you know, is the axe. What is the axe without the hand that swings it? What is the saw without the hand that shakes it? What's the rod without the hand that controls it? My friend, even evildoers can be a rod in God's hand. And in this instance, they were a rod, the Assyrians were a rod in God's hand of judgment for His people as God had promised His people. If you worship idols, I'll judge you. If you aren't faithful, I'll judge you. And so, uh, even <coughs> evildoers can be used 
by God or can be a rod in God's hand. But God ultimately shows Assyria. He said, but I will judge you. And my friend, let me just tell you something. David said it this way. He said, fret not thyself because of the evildoers. Neither be thou envious against the uh, workers of iniquity. For they shall soon be cut down as the grass and wither as the green herb. In other words, my friend, any evil as it is manifested in the person. By the way, evil is in persons. An evil person who manifests himself, my friend, has a day of reckoning and a day of judgment. And this brings me to a, a quick realization of something that I realized some years ago. You know, sometimes I wish somebody would do something about all the, about all the evildoers. Sometimes I thought, God, why don't you do something? You ever thought that? God, why don't you do something about, you know, whatever it is that people are doing? And I I've long ago realized that God, if God judged all the wicked people in this room, I'd be in trouble. Every one of us would. And so, my friend, it's a wonderful thing that God is a God of mercy. Amen. And so this evening, that's what we're really looking at. We, if you were to read chapters 10 through 25 of Isaiah, you would see God addressing the prophecy of destruction to the wicked nations. And really, at the time, all the nations that were represented in the world, and God prophesying their destruction. And those nations, as a people groups, have been destroyed uh, today. And then God's saying, then there's going to come a day when I'm going to when I'm going to do the things that he describes ultimately in verse 8. He's going to swallow up death in victory, and it's the Lord God's going to wipe away tears from off all faces. Okay, so let's bring ourselves there very quickly. Before we do, let me just say one last thing, and that is that it's very easy to know God. I could not in an evening tell you everything there is to know about God because, first of all, I don't know everything there is to know about God. I'm a student. I'm learning. I'm getting to know God. That's why we're studying Isaiah. Boy, you get a good glimpse of who God is. And the two major things that we've seen in Isaiah is that God wants judgment and righteousness. So he's a God who desires for things to be right, doesn't like corruption, and he likes he wants righteousness, and that's what he desired of his people. And so that's just some things that we've seen about God as we're getting to know him. But I can tell you about enough about God this evening. Not being able to tell you everything there's to know about God, but I can tell you enough about God that you can know that you're on your way to heaven. That's the most important thing in the world. Here's the deal. Uh, the Bible says something that upon reflection all of us know is true, and that is that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In other words, listen, you have a problem with everybody else's sin, but God has a problem with my sin. Right. right. And that's the sin that matters. The Bible says I've come short of the glory of God. The fact is, is that uh, God's perfect, I'm not, and so I'm not good enough to have a relationship with Him. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. In other words, because of what I've done, I deserve to die, and, we, and I'll die. Everyone that, that I've known has come to a certain stage or place or will come to a stage or place when ultimately ends in death. My, my great aunt Margie, uh, we, they just celebrated her 100th birthday just about a week ago. And uh, she, she gets around rather well. She, they, she sold her car this past year. She's not driving anymore. At 100 years old, she quit driving. But um, they, my, they, they talked her out of her car. And, uh, but she, she does do rather well. She's not shoveling snow this past winter. She didn't shovel snow either, but I'm sure she'll plant her garden and do those things. She's in pretty good health. But you know, she gets kind of angry sometimes. She gets kind of mad, and I'll tell you what makes her really angry. She gets mad that she's outlived everybody. It frustrates her because, I mean, it's like, you know, she's watched her generation come and go, and then she watched the next generation, a lot of them die off, and the third generation that she knows is gone. And I'm just telling you, it's, it's kind of lonely realizing I'm the last one. And uh, death is a reality. It's a real thing. It happened because of the sin curse. And it's not morbid to talk about it. It's actually practical to talk about it. You know, it's, a lot of people go through their whole life never wanting to talk about the day that they're going to die. And my friend, that's the worst thing you could possibly do is to go to your grave unprepared. And so uh, one of the things that I've realized is, is that the wages of sin is death, and that's true. Everybody who's ever lived has died. We've been studying Romans on Sunday mornings, and one of the things that we saw was that even before the law of Moses, uh, the illustration was that from Adam until Moses, death reigned. And so people have died ever since Adam sinned, and sin nature has been passed on. But God prophesied, uh, there was a prophecy right in the fall of, right when God dealt with man's original sin, and that was that the seed of the woman, Amen. from the seed of the woman, there would be one who would bruise the serpent's head or to do a death blow to sin. My friend, that was a prophecy of the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. Suffice it to say that Jesus came about 2,000 years ago. And He came as a child, came as a babe. He didn't have an earthly father because He was conceived of the Holy Ghost, and therefore He did not have a sin nature. And Jesus lived a perfect life, and He did miracles that proved that He was God. 
And, after, and having done those miracles, Jesus ultimately laid down his life. When he was put up on the cross, those individuals who mocked and scorned him said, you're the son of God, call down angels or come down off the cross. And uh, Jesus told very clearly, he said, you're not taking my life from me, I'm laying it down myself. In other words, Jesus died, but he did not die because of, he died because of sin, but he did not die because of his sin. He did die because of my sin, because of yours. And the Bible makes a very, very simple offer. And, and Jesus said himself in John chapter, uh, John 3 records it, he says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. You probably know this verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Then later on it says, he that believeth is not condemned. He that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed. And friend, if, you, if you've been paying attention up to this point, good. Let me summarize, and this should be a help for you. The reality of it is that any person this evening could come into this room and not know for certain where they're going to go when, they're, when they die. But if you'll put your trust in the fact that Jesus died on the cross for your sin, was buried and rose again, and you look to the free gift that Jesus offered, whosoever shall call in the name of the Lord shall be saved, and simply call out to God and say, God, I want Jesus to be my Savior. I want you to be my Father, my friend. God will save you because you have just... You have just demonstrated faith. In the same way, in, in the wilderness, when the children of Israel sinned against God, and God told them, if you'll look to that brass serpent, you'll live. By simply looking to the brass serpent, they show that they believe God. And by calling out and asking Jesus to be your Savior, my friend, you will be demonstrating faith in God, and God will save you just for the asking. You say, Pastor, that sounds too simple. My friend, would you like the complicated version? Never sin. Yeah. Sure. Be perfect. You still won't be God. That's the complicated version. People call the simple version easy believism. I don't think that anyone wants hard believism. I don't think there would be anybody that qualified for it, to be quite truthful with you. And my friend, God loves you very much. If I haven't said that yet this evening, I want you to know God loves you so much that even though He's a righteous and a holy and a just judge, and even though He's never going to allow evil, my friend, He's always ultimately going to judge every wicked one. He has taken His own Son and judged our evil on Him. Judged His Son in our place so that we could have a relationship with Him. My friend, that's a very good God. Now, suffice that all, or having said that all, let's, let's say then, let's come to an agreement about something. I hope you agree with me that today is a good day to be alive. I'll just be honest with you, I'm just glad I'm alive today. I'm not glad I'm alive today because they have iPhones. Never had an iPhone. Lord, helping me. Uh, well, I'm not going to make any extreme statements. Uh, when I become a senior citizen, I'll get an iPhone, maybe. Um, but I've never, you know, I'm not glad to be alive today because they have iPhones. I'm picking on you, Brother Rizzo. I know you use an iPhone. Men shouldn't do that. It's always embarrassing me seeing you with that thing. But anyway, <laughs> I just couldn't help picking on you. It's been a while. All right. Uh, so, <laughs> unless they're senior citizens, it's okay then. Anyway. Oh, yeah, Joel does. Oh, my. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's let's move on. I'm glad to be alive today. I'm not glad because of technology. I'm not glad to be alive today uh, because Donald Trump is our president. Uh, I'm not glad. To, don't get mad at me just for saying. Some people are like, "Oh man, you had to bring that up, didn't you?" Listen, I didn't make Donald Trump our president. Uh, it's not my fault. Okay. Uh, I'm not glad to be alive today because Donald Trump is president. I'm not glad to be alive today because the air conditioner is working especially well, which it isn't, evidently. Uh, I'm not glad to be alive today because of technological advances and medical um, outlook. You know, I just saw the other day that there was a type of a drug that appears to cure a type of cancer. And I think that's wonderful, don't you? Yeah. Cancer has been a deeply painful thing in my life, but I do recognize that those that I've lost uh, to cancer, if there were a medical drug that could cure that, that they would die from something else. And so I'm not glad to be alive because of medical advances. I'm glad to be alive today because of the opportunity that happened because of Jesus dying on the cross of Calvary. The fact of the matter is, is that grace has never been more easily received. God's word has not never been more easily accessed, and truth has not never been more easily attained than it is in this day. And that's the reality. And by the way, as a preacher of the gospel, it's never been easier to preach the gospel than it is today. That's just a fact. I'm telling you, I, I get, it's, it amazes me every time somebody sends me an email 
ask me a question about being born again. It's just think, here's somebody on the other side of the world whom I've never met who's watched some video that Tony's posted on YouTube, and they're calling me and asking me spiritual questions, and they become born again from something. It's just amazing to me. It's just, just mind-boggling, and how easy it is to preach the gospel and how easy it is to receive the gospel. Uh, I, I'm glad to be alive today because, first of all, I'm grateful for God making me who I am and making me in the day and time that He did. But, friend, ultimately it's because of what He's done because Jesus died on the cross. And, my friend, we don't have to look forward to what God is going to do and hope that He actually does it. We can look back and recognize that what He said He would do, He actually did. I love reading the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9 where the Bible says the Messiah is going to be cut off. And it literally is a prophecy of the death of Jesus Christ dying on the cross for sins. As good a day as it is to be alive, my friend, it just gets better. It just gets better. One of the things that happened when Jesus was raised from the dead was that believers were able to go from being in a place where they were separated from God in paradise, and there was a gulf in, uh, be between paradise and hell. Believers were able to be in paradise, and actually you see an account after the resurrection of Jesus, that the saints were resurrected and they went into Jerusalem and they went around the city. And then where did those saints go? Well, they ascended up and they're in heaven. And uh, Corinthians tells us, Paul tells us in Corinthians, he says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And I have some dearly loved ones who are gone and they're in, sleeping in Jesus Christ, my friend. And it is a very great comfort to me to know that they're with the Lord Jesus right now. They're with God in heaven. That's a guarantee. It's a very comforting fact for me as well to know that uh, I don't have to fear death. Matter of fact, sometimes I think about, you know, we'll be getting together with people, we'll be having a good time, and I'll think of somebody who can't be there. And I'll think, man, I wish they were here. And then I reflect and think, but they don't wish they were here because where they're at is better than here. And so then I think, I wish I were there. And I understand what Paul is saying when he says, For the, the, we that are in this body do groan. And he says, you know, sometimes we long to put off this tabernacle, this tent, this temporary body, and have a body which is in heaven or <coughs> absent from the body and present with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's pretty good to have that kind of confidence. Now, I know what it is to be a young person and hope you never die, but uh, I also know what it is to be not so young and to recognize that even if I die, things will just get better. And I want to tell you, that's a reality for every person who is in the Lord Jesus Amen. Christ, is that things are just going to get better. Things are just going to get better. And the very worst thing, the worst case scenario on most people's minds is the very best thing for a person who knows the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't have a death wish. I love life and I love living. But you know, even on earth there's going to be a better day to live. And that's what I want to look at this evening very briefly. And uh, that's verse 8 as we look at what God is going to do in the future. It's wonderful if you read these prophecies because we have just seen that God is going, that we've just seen God's prophecy of the destruction of the nations which have wickedly sinned against Him. But in verse 8 of Isaiah 25, the promise about God is this. He will swallow up death in victory. He will swallow up death in victory. If, if you have a Bible or if, uh, if you uh, don't have one, if someone near you would share it with you, that would be good. But if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I would just like to look at a passage of Scripture that is the fulfillment of this prophecy. And I would like to point out that this is a prophecy which is already fulfilled today. In other words, there's two prophecies in Isaiah 25, 8. One is as uh, future and, and for us is already been, has already been fulfilled. And the second prophecy is one which is a future event that's even, that uh, makes the one that's been fulfilled even better. So look at, uh, if you're in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 with me now, would you look at verse 51? I think many of you have this passage of Scripture memorized. If you do, please don't, uh, don't quote it out loud, but quote along with it and try to pay attention to the words as we read it beginning in verse 51 of 1 Corinthians 15. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Now, it's a fad today, and this is a little excursus. It's a fad today to not believe that there's going to be a snatching up of the saints, or as it's been called, a rapture. And a lot of people today are teaching that there's no rapture. My friend, we shall not all sleep. And those of us that do not sleep will be caught up. And we will be caught up before the Lord Jesus comes at His second coming. And His second coming is what we just saw in Revelation where Jesus comes down to judge the earth. My friend, before that happens, we're going to be taken up. Either through death, which is sleep, the word sleep means to die, or through, uh, through being caught up or being, being uh, changed. The Bible says it this way. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, 
and we shall be changed. And so all those bodies which have gone into the ground are going to come back up again. <laughs> Incidentally, this is an important passage for Christians to consider when it comes to having a Christian burial. I, I don't have anything condemning or negative to say about someone who has made a choice of cremation, but it's a wonderful thing to plant your body in the ground as a testimony that it's going to rise. And so I want a cheap funeral. I hope my uh, wife doesn't spend a lot of money burying me. You know, I really don't even need the pine box, maybe a gunny sack or at least just a six-foot hole you could kick me into. I'll dig it myself if I'm up to it. Uh, but, uh, anyway, but I, but I don't want to be cremated if I can help it. And the reason for it is that I want people to know that this body is going to be raised. The dead in Christ are going to rise first, and that would be those of us which, uh, which, which die uh, before the Lord Jesus comes to take us. Okay, so the Bible says in verse 53, for this corruptible... That means this body which can die must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So, when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Where was that saying written? Isaiah chapter 25 and verse 8. Death is swallowed up in victory. So, my friend, I want us to, to understand this evening that there is a bit of a foretelling or future event, even in, in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse uh, 54, when the Scripture says, Then shall be brought to pass the saying, Death is swallowed up in victory. My friend, the truth of the matter is, is that it is true today, the commentary in verse 55 and 6. O death, where is thy stain? O grave, where is thy victory? Now listen to me for just a moment. Those individuals in this world who do not know Jesus as their Savior are spending most of their life trying to figure out how, how to deal with death. Now, people are dealing with death. Every person is dealing with death differently, isn't it? Some people deal with death by not acknowledging it. Matter of fact, I, I know some dear ones uh, who actually don't acknowledge the death of their loved ones. They just don't admit that they're dead, that they're gone. But you can't talk to them about it because they'll say they're not gone, they're not dead. They just don't acknowledge it. They don't acknowledge that they'll ever die. They just don't deal with it. And so death it has a bit of a sting to it for them, wouldn't you say? Um, I, there are individuals who spend their time trying to prolong their selves, prolong their life. Um, don't misunderstand this. I like to tease about it because it's funny. I like to pick on the health movement just a little bit just because the people can get so weird in the health. You know what I'm talking about, right? If you're a health movement person, laugh with me. Okay, because it's really true. You know, I mean, right now, oils can heal and fix anything and everything. So you've got the essential oils people. And it's true, isn't it, Brother Rizzo? You know, your wife does it? Does she? Does she? No. Okay, good. All right. And yeah, my wife's not healing too many things with oils, but I know some people that have gotten a little bit too much. But, uh, <laughs> you know, there's the, the and I, I'm, only, I'm only teasing. I'm, I'm not seriously picking about this. But I know some people, I mean, if you want to have a conversation with them, they want to find out what you're eating. And if you are not taking enough flaxseed oil, you're not going to get into a new conversation. You need flaxseed oil. And, I, you know, it's a religion. I mean, it really is. I mean, it's like flaxseed oil. You better have some flaxseed oil. True. Coconut oil is pretty good, too. That's kind of my one. Uh, a little bit. <laughs> but uh, coconut oil or, or whatever the thing is, you know, or, man, red meat or meat or being vegan or being vegetarian or being whatever, 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 whatever. And I mean, it really is... The most important thing, literally, you get off work and they go to their co-ops and their stores and, and uh, get together with people. And uh, you have weekends and they go to their, uh, to their meetings and their get-togethers and it literally is their religion, it's their worship. Why is that so? Well, because they're trying to prolong their life. Now, I'm not picking on you if that's you here this evening. But the fact of the matter is that a lot of people are bothered by death, are they not? A lot of people are afraid of death and one of the ways to deal with death is to try not to die. I always have thought, now this is just an opinion of mine, but based on my history, I've always thought I'll probably go by squashing or something like that, so I don't worry about being too healthy when I die that way. Just, just the way things seem to happen for me. I've had a lot of thuds and bangs and, and so forth since I've been married, having my sweetheart. She, my wife will testify that probably I'll get killed. I probably won't. Uh, just, you know, it probably won't be bad health that'll get me. It'll be you know, hey, y'all watch this or something like that. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, uh, unfortunately, it's a reality that there is death. But my friend, let's get serious for just a minute. And let's just say something. Isn't it a sweet thing that death has lost its sting? I can make jokes about it. Honestly, I can talk about how I want to be buried, and it's funny to me. 
And it's not funny to me because I'm morbid. It's funny to me because I have no fear of death. I'm not afraid of it. Matter of fact, I recognize that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And sometimes the most frustrating times in this life is when I love this life too much. And I love it more than I love eternity. And it's a beautiful thing that because of the cross of Calvary that God, uh, years before Christ even came, to, gave us a promise, a prophecy of the Scripture that says, death will be swallowed up in victory. Death will be swallowed up in victory. And the greatest victory in my life is when I put off this body, which I'm just trying to get to make it, until I die. That's all I got to do. I'm not worried about, you know, I just got to limp it along long enough to make it to the grave, and I'll be good enough. And the fact of the matter is that I'm going to get a body which is resurrected, which is a perfect body, which is a sinless body. Well, you know, I don't know about you, but it's hard for me to do right sometimes, isn't it? You ever, you know, should get up and you don't feel like it? You ever should work harder and you don't? You ever ought to say or do or something, and a lot of times it's because this body just doesn't feel good? The reality is someday I'm going to have a body that doesn't have anything like that. No sin curse. It's going to be an absolutely positively perfect body. There won't be any aches and bruises and pains and limps and gimps and all those things. I'll just be whole. And I look forward to that day. And the fact of the matter is, is that it's a very sweet thing that death is swallowed up in victory. The Bible says, though, and this, note this, that the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But verse 57, But thanks be to God which giveth us a victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Suffice it to say this evening, my friend, that victory over death is through Jesus Christ our Lord. If I haven't said anything this evening that you've picked up or caught yet, I'm trying to tell you that Jesus is the means for victory. If you want to live a victorious, joyful, happy life, my friend, get to know Jesus as your Savior, and He will absolutely, positively change everything. Amen. And you'll understand things from a perspective you never had before. One last thing I want to look at in verse 8. Back to Isaiah 25. I'll begin to read it even before you're there because we've read it together already. Isaiah 25, verse 8, the Bible says in the second part of that verse, And the rebuke of his people shall take away from off of all the earth. Oh, I'm sorry, the second part of the first phrase. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces. And the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off all the earth, for the Lord hath spoken it. The reality of it is, is that Isaiah had a pretty tough ministry. We actually looked at his ministry. Uh, when we began our series and our study. And one of the things that was very difficult about Isaiah's ministry was that he would preach the gospel, or he would preach the prophecy to a people who had eyes but didn't see, who had people to people who had ears but didn't hear, and whose hearts would not listen. And they, they couldn't be converted. But he also had a prophecy to the remnant, those who would hear and those who would receive. The warning that we see here, though, is that God's people, national Israel, it's not going to be that there's only going to be a remnant. The day is going to come when God is going to save the whole nation and God's going to bless the earth through that nation. We go to Revelation in chapter 21 with me, please. We'll look at the fulfillment. You could also look at it at a near fulfillment of it in Revelation chapter 7 and verse 4, I believe it is. But if, if you go to Revelation chapter uh, 21, and uh, I'd like to look at verse 4. Well, let's look at verse 1 through 4. And this is John. This is after God has judged the wicked, after the devil's been thrown in the bottomless pit. And this is when, uh, this is when uh, Christ has reigned for a thousand years. And after this, the white throne of judgment. God has judged all the wicked in the world. So the second prophecy we see this evening will be the time and the day when God judges all the wicked. You've got a problem with God not judging the wicked, my friend. Let me just tell you something. It is only because of God's long suffering and right. His mercy that they have not yet been judged. Yeah. But all the wicked will be judged. And they will either have received Jesus as their Savior and Christ will have taken their judgment, or they will receive their judgment themselves and they will be cast into the lake of fire and death and hell will be cast into the lake of fire. That's the second death. That's the final death. <coughs> At this point, though, the Bible says in verse uh, 1 of Revelation 21, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Now, in a few weeks I'm going to preach uh, in, on Sunday evening from Revelation 21. I'd like to say a lot of things about the text this evening because a lot of people have a mistaken understanding of heaven. And I'll be honest with you, I kind of can relate to Tom Sawyer when he talked about, you know, the uh, Widow Douglas's uh, heaven versus, uh, what was the other lady that lived with her, Miss Watson? Watson. 
Mrs. Watson's heaven. He said, Mrs. Watson tell you about heaven. He said, body wouldn't want to go there. And he said, Widow, De Widow Douglas would tell you about heaven and make your mouth water, you know, and you'd want to be there. Well, the reality of it is a lot of people think that, you know, we're going to be flying around in little clouds looking like cherubs with little... I, I would like to be, you know, the guy on Valentine's Day shooting people. But uh, the reality is, is that, you know, we see people in clouds with harps and all this nonsense. God's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. Now, let me just, just offer you some comforting things about that. I believe that we ought to take very good care of the earth that God has entrusted us to have dominion over. Don't you agree? I think it's irresponsible to be wasteful and destructive with this earth that God's created. First of all, it shows a lack of respect for God the Creator. And secondly, uh, it, it uh, defies what our purpose is. We're supposed to have dominion over. We're supposed to take care of it. But let me just tell you something. As good a care as anyone could take of the earth, one day it's going to be it's going to pass away with a great noise with a fervent heat. But God's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. The difference will be that it will not be uh, sin-cursed, and it will not have a sin-cursed people on it. And that's where we're going to live. And God's going to build a new Jerusalem. And on that new Jerusalem, the Bible says that the tabernacle of God is going to be with men. Literally, God's going to have a, a tent or a tabernacle, a dwelling place there where He can be with us. And over that new Jerusalem, that tent will be heaven. Literally, we'll be able to have access to God. And just It'll be an amazing place. So we're going to have, in heaven, we're going to have mansions, apartments that God has prepared for us. Places that God's prepared for us. But you know, sometimes when I think about going to heaven, I just think about, you know, I don't know, playing some instrument or singing some kind of choir. And I think, man, I might get a little bit bored with that sometimes. Well, friend, I won't get bored worshiping the Lord Jesus right. and glorifying God. But you know, the new earth is going to be an amazing place. I, I suspect uh, that the fish will be bigger there and uh, we'll catch more of them. The waters will be clearer and the cars will be faster and I don't know what else. But the reality of it is it's going to be a real tangible place that we're actually going to live. We're going to be able to be the people that we are without having our sin-cursed nature. It won't be nice to live around people that aren't sinners. It won't be nice to be, not be a sinner and live around people. And it's going to be a wonderful place. And the Bible says at that time, in verse 4, the Bible says, and God shall, or verse 3, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with him, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And then verse 4, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death. Aren't you glad for that? I'm going to tell you something. I've literally hurt for, for more than a year at a time with my heart just literally just in pain because of deaths, because of lost loved ones, spouses, no more death. And the Bible goes on to say, And there shall be no more, or neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any pain, more pain, for the former things are passed away. And I just want to tell you something. God's new economy will be even better than His old economy. I'm glad to be alive today, to be honest with you. I don't have a gripe. I don't have a complaint about this life or the world that I live in. I actually love it. I love where I live. I love what I get to do. I love the time that God has placed me on earth. My friend, as good as it is, it's only going to get better. But it's only going to get better for those who know the Lord Jesus as their Savior. So in concluding this evening, I want to ask a simple question. The question would be this. Do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus as, his, as your Savior? And the second question would be, if the answer is, is no, would you like to receive Him? You know, you could this evening very, very simply. You wouldn't have to tell me wouldn't have to come forward. You wouldn't have to do anything. You could simply just talk to God about it. I can't save anybody. I can't do anything for anyone to be saved. I can only tell them what God's done. My friend, God loves you very much. And Jesus died on the cross for you. He died for your sin. If you will just reconcile yourself to God, just acknowledge that, God, I'm a sinner, and I know that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I'm asking you to save me because of what Jesus did. My friend, right where you're at, right where you're at, God will save you. God would save your soul, and you would be able to look forward to this new heaven, new earth, and there are probably people, dear ones, that you love and that you know that are already there that you'll get to spend eternity with. I don't know about you, but this, the third question I would ask this evening, I think would apply to most of us, certainly applies to me. And that is that the question, do you have a real picture of what it's all about? In other words, is your worldview right on? What are you living for? Are you living for things that will only last this week or this month or this year or certainly can't last beyond this life? I thought many times... If I were to try to think about what I did on a particular day or, or week or hour in a particular year, then most of the time I can't remember what I even did. A lot of the times the reason for it is that because of what I did, though it may have been necessary at the time, really wasn't eternally significant. And I believe that most of us spend our lives doing things that don't matter forever. Most of the time we spend, we do things that, that just don't have eternal ramifications and consequences. I want to remind us that the day is going to come when God's going to wipe away all tears. There's going to be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain. The former things are going to be passed away. And when those former things are going to be passed away, will you have given your best for Jesus? 
we have lived your life for the Lord Jesus Christ? It's a pretty important question. I love the hymn, I wonder, have I done my best for Jesus? And I wonder that sometimes. Yeah, I wonder, wonder. You know, I don't think any person, I think it would be prideful to say, oh, I couldn't have done more. I've done everything that I could. But I'll tell you, it's a wonderful day when I can say, you know what, I believe God's pleased with my life today. And you know you could do that every day. You could live your life in such a way that the things that matter are given the are given the priority that they deserve. And the things that don't matter are given the lack of priority that they deserve. And my friend, you'd be able to bank on what God is going to do because we saw in chapter 25 of Isaiah that God is always faithful. And so what God says He would, what God has said He would do, He has done. And what God has said He will do, He will do. And you can believe it. Father, thank you for your word this evening. I just pray that you would help it to sink home in our lives, thrill our hearts and our souls, and help us to live more for Jesus. As a result, we pray in his precious name. Amen. Thank you for your good attention this evening. Before we dismiss everyone, I would like to take some prayer requests, uh, if anyone has any prayer requests to share. And if you'd like to share something to thank God for, that God, an answer to prayer, that would be appropriate as well.